Um, but I, if that's all right, I think we can go ahead and get started and just keep letting people in as they come. Welcome everybody to our second Women in Security um, event. We have several very talented, intelligent speakers with us today, and we're going to cover various topics uh, regarding gender inequality. So buckle up, it's going to be a great event, and I'm going to pass it over to our moderator for today, uh, Thomas Brancato. Take it away. Thank you, Amber. Thank you so much. And it's uh, well, welcome everybody to the Women in Security event number two. As Amber said, uh, I'll be moderating today's event, presenting the speakers, and of course, um, letting each of you have a chance of uh, asking your questions or your comments towards the end of the presentation today. But without further ado, uh, my name is Thomas Brancato, Internship Program Coordinator at the Global Counterterrorism Institute, and it is uh, an honor to, to present some of our guest speakers today, including uh, Dr. Gerb Ricard, Dr. Begum Barak, and Dr. Shireen Queen. And uh, we'll be heading over their profiles in a brief moment, um, but I did want to remark that uh, this is the second event, but it's the first one that I'm participating in. So thanks to yourselves, Amber, and of course the speakers today uh, for, for allowing me that, uh, that privilege. Um, so today we're going to be starting um, with Dr. Gurpri Kaur, who's going to be uh, presenting uh, her first topic here and, um, for the event. Now, I do want to remind our audience that it, the top, the overarching topic for today will be um, how gender inequality uh, impacts or what its role is within terrorism and extremism. And we'll be coming at that from different angles, from different um, speakers, from different academics, and of course, from different perspectives. So I'm very excited personally to, to see the results. I've had the, the privilege of speaking with uh, Dr. Kaur and of course with uh, Begum uh, previously, and um, you'll be notified of that as um, the CGTI will be releasing some promotional videos of what we call the fireside chats that accompanies this event today. So stay tuned for that. But without further ado, uh, Gurpreet, it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to have you here today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Thomas. Thank you so much. Um, can I share the screen now or? Give me just one second, Gurpreet, because okay. I wanted to introduce you to everyone here who might not be aware of, uh, of who you are and of course of your work. So uh, just for a brief moment, um, Dr. Gurpreet Kaur is, um, has had a career change from academia to policy work. And she's currently pursuing her second master's in law, specializing in human rights, conflict and justice at the SOAS, uh, University of London. She's interested in the interconnections between gender, international law, and counterterrorism. So in effect, her thesis uh, that she's working on currently is titled The Figure of the Female Terrorist in International Human Rights Law. With a PhD in gender and post-colonial literature from the University of Warwick uh, in the United Kingdom, Gurpreet has previously worked on post-colonial ecofeminism, films and television, South Asian fiction, and media. Uh, she's published extensively in these fields, co-edited a book on Southeast Asia ecologies, and presented her research at several international conferences. Uh, she received her BA, Honours and MA from the National University of Singapore. So, uh, Gurpreet, with that amazing biography, I'm sure you'll have an amazing presentation for us today. So without further ado, please take the stage. Thank you so much, Thomas. Thank you. Just bear with me as I share my screen. All right. Okay. So, good um, good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Um, Thomas, Todd, everyone, thank you for having me on this panel. Um, I will be talking about gender inequality and the securitization of gender today. What I will do first is give you a quick run through of the structural factors of inequality. Uh, what is even meant by that uh, and how they have been exacerbated by historical factors such as colonization. And if the securitization of gender addresses these structural factors in a bit to put in place de-radicalization strategies. 
This is just a very, very quick run through of a topic in 10 to 12 minutes, which typically spans a few months if it is taught as a as a university course or something as a teaching thing. So um, I'm very, very happy to address any questions at the end of the presentation. So what do we actually mean by structural factors of gender inequality? Structural factors refer to the unequal division of power and resources between women and men. This, is, this inequality is assigned through gendered mechanisms which are produced, reproduced and maintained at the individual, societal, cultural, institutional, religious, familial and state levels. Eurohealth, which is um, a website, and they released a policy report, they actually have a very nice quotation that sums it up. And they say, norms, values, and practices give rise to clear distinctions between the sexes and to allocating women as subordinated to men in most important spheres of life. For example, type of education, labor, market position, and unpaid duties, burden of care work as well. So basically, structural how societies are organized, laws are set, economies function, and ideologies are shaped. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to take you through two examples of structural inequality at the level of laws and legislation, and other two at the level that have their basis, such laws and legislation. I can't take you through everyone at every single level, so just quickly. So the first one that I'm going to touch on are land laws. Um, in a lot of the global south, but also in other parts of the world, women till much of the land for agriculture, but have no official rights to the land. Land is usually owned by men. Uh, compounding this are caste and class factors which further complicate the issue when land ownership is directly tied to access to global commons or resources such as access to clean drinking water. Uh, a lot of rural to urban migration happens, which sees a lot of men going to cities to work, which leaves behind the women folk and they till the land. Now, if there is a lower caste woman who is tilling the land but has no rights to the land as ownership, she does not have a source of clean drinking water on her land, but say her neighbor who is upper caste Brahmin and has a tube well which is clean, which has clean water, she basically cannot access that clean water, one, because she doesn't own any of the land, Two, she is lower caste. So you see compounding factors that happen when laws are in fact um, discriminatory. So the second one that I'm going to take you through are inheritance laws. So um, societal and cultural practices So again, for example, in India, constitutionally, the rights of wives and daughters to inherit a property is recognized in equal capacity. Culturally, this is not practiced. So uh, we have a situation of de jure and de facto laws, which are there. Uh, de facto practices don't take, you know, don't take into account the laws that are constitutionally enshrined. And as a practice, what happens is that this is perpetuated over generations. This has actual implications because um, not just when a family member dies of you know, natural causes, but implications when men die in armed conflict, battle, wars, and conflict. So men die, but people who are left behind, wives who are left behind, daughters who are left behind, effectively don't own land or property there. So the phenomenon that th this gives rise to is actually termed as female-headed poverty. One land, uh, but they don't own the land. And two, because of inheritance laws, they can't own the property, their ancestral property or familial property. It is passed from husband to sons to brothers. So um, this is one level when what we mean by structural inequality. So. Second level that we are talking about is the wage gap. 
right? So um, this is clear cut discrimination, uh, mainly because of gender stereotypes. There are cultural attitudes towards men and women. Men are breadwinners, women are caretakers. Uh, women's wages especially start taking a hit when they become mothers. Uh, a very, very good documentary on this was released. Uh, I think it was on Netflix. Uh, I'll pass on the title at some point if you all want it. But it specifically talks about how um, wage gaps seriously, seriously um, widens. So around the world, we also have quotas for women in certain countries to enter certain professions. So Singapore, for example, up to 2004, had a quota for women to enter medicine. Uh, the quota was compounded by uh, race quotas. So if you were non-Chinese, uh, if you were Indian, uh, there was only one third of that quota for women reserved for you. So it was only in 2004, after much lobbying, that those quotas were removed. Um, next one, we have lack of political participation. So this is a photograph in front of you uh, of ministers of foreign affairs of the US, UK, Russia, Germany, France, China, and the EU with Iran negotiating in Lausanne for a comprehensive agreement on the Iranian nuclear program as recent as 2015. Can anyone see a woman? I think there is one, but can anyone else see a woman of color? No. So this is a real, real structural issue. Um, the structural barriers to entry usually are patriarchal socialization, gendered social roles, expectations, Institutional infrastructure, working patterns, unaffordable or unavailable child care, inadequate maternity or paternity leave arrangements, etc. Poverty, economic dependence. Um, Northern Ireland actually did a study which also cited um, intimidation, sexual abuse, harassment in women's roles in politics. Uh, I think that is uh, that is not a not a secret. You know, it's not an open. It's not a surprise. Um, all justice due to inequitable distribution of resources and power. Add to this mix health, reproductive rights, climate change, and we didn't even talk about domestic and sexual abuse and violence. So um, one of the things that when we talk about structural factors um, is that Almost always, women are treated as a homogenous group. Uh, the fact is they are not. Um, and it is fundamental to recognize that because they are not a homogenous group, women face many different forms of discrimination in everyday life on the basis of race, uh, ethnic origin, sexual orientation, age, disability. And they are amplified when they attempt to access or exercise their right to political participation. Moving on to historical factors, um, this is a map that I used in my teaching showing um, European colonization of the world. The dark brown, maroon brown parts are, you know, British, uh, the British Empire. The reddish ones are the Spanish Empire, and the blue is the French Empire. Um, much of the the uh, the the terrorist and radicalization patterns that we are seeing. I mean, let's not talk about foreign terrorist fighters, but a lot of them are coming out in the areas that were formerly colonized. And once we move on to say 1914, we have the mix of Japan and the US as colonizers as well. So how does this tie into structural factors of gender inequality? So there is a phenomenon called as the double bind of women. patriarchy and to colonization. Um, colonialism actually intensifies patriarchal oppression. 
Um, Edward Said's Orientalism is instrumental in how colonial attitudes develop towards natives. Uh, natives were, native men especially, were viewed as noble savages, brutish, infantile. This actually uh, brought about the binaries of us versus them, West versus the rest, that is, is entrenched so deeply in a lot of the talk that we do. Um, the feminization of Eastern men uh, excluded them from practicing democratic rights as they were not believed to be responsible enough to hold a democratic state, requiring a paternal colonial presence to properly govern the country and the people. Um, and one poem that um, exemplifies this is Rudyard Kipling's The White Man's Burden, which is, you know, aptly shown here, uh, the white soldier carrying the noble savage. Um, so what then, Guy Three Spivak in Can the Subaltern Speak uh, uses this phrase. Uh, she says uh, colonization basically at the heart was white men saving brown women from brown men. Uh, this was used in reference to the practice of sati, which uh, is uh, widows burning themselves on the pyres of their husbands which was characterized as a very, very brutish practice uh, of Hindus in the whole of India, uh, when actually it wasn't the whole of India or the whole of Hindus. It was just practiced in one part of India, uh, which then became amplified as, oh my God, these are noble savages, look at all the savagery we are doing. Um, and Franz Fanon, uh, who wrote Wretched of the Earth, that was the first study that actually combined psychoanalysis and looked at how violence affected men's psyche. And he cites the powerlessness of local men that intensified patriarchal domination at the domestic level. So although men on both sides of the colonial divide were engaged in strife, they often collaborated in the domination of women. And what you had were new forms of patriarchal domination that was introduced. And indigenous peoples were subjected to genocide, economic exploitation, cultural decimation, political exclusion. Um, Africa has the legacy of the transatlantic slave trade and colonial laws. Section 377A, which is the Victorian law penalizing homosexuality that was exported to all British colonies, um, which a lot of uh, them are still contending with. Singapore still has that in place. Uh, none of them had laws that actually outlawed homosexuality or any type of other uh, you know, gender slippages that happened. Um, so a lot of the colonization at the heart, um, it is um, inequality is at the heart of colonization. So unequal relations of power, which have basically historically impacted gender and structural factors of gender inequality. So how does this all tie up with terrorism, radicalization, counterterrorism strategies, and the securitization of gender? Um, the Women, Peace and Security Agenda currently, um, there are 10 resolutions aimed at participation of women in peacemaking and peace building and preventing and addressing conflict related sexual violence. So I've actually categorized them on the slide. Um, and out of this, 2 to 4 2 is the one that actually has a mention of what do we do when women get radicalized? And there's one sentence in one paragraph. I spoke about this at the first event that I was invited to. It's the problem and solution both in women. And um, it's, a, it, it's a dichotomized, oh, you're the problem, but you're also the solution. And that gets perpetuated in everything else. Um, there are also calls for gender mainstreaming throughout security mechanisms. So 2178, which is the um, UNSC resolution on foreign terrorist fighters under chapter seven, uh, paragraph 16 has a mention of empowering women. Um, but every approach so far falls back on the idea of women as victims as seen through colonization. Women always need saving from something. Instead of having women as stakeholders or as decision makers, instead of actively engaging and listening to what women need in a given situation. Um, Azave Marvini in her book, um, I have the book right here actually, uh, it's called uh, Guest House for Young Widows. 
uh, she wrote a book on ISIS, um, the women of ISIS. She says that um, honestly dealing with problems of modern conflicts involves acknowledging awkward truths about how we have ended up with such violence in the first place. And I think that captures the whole gender inequality conundrum that we are facing today. Any measure that attempts to deal with gender inequality without considering the structural and historical factors that have led to such inequalities will fall short of hitting at the heart of the situation. There are colonial legacies to contend with in the form of laws of unequal wealth, of political exclusion of entire peoples. There are micro and macro structural factors to contend with that are exacerbated by local complexities. So an intersectional approach is required. And I'm going to leave you with the words of Professor Gina Heathcote. She's a leading scholar on, a uh, leading legal scholar on um, women and security. And she has this to say, particularly with regards to UNSC Resolution 2242. The risk of progressing work on women, peace and security within global structures without attention to the diversity of women's needs, lives and experiences drawn from a feminist commitment to post-colonial listening is likely to produce a series of regressive outcomes that perpetuate victim feminisms and which fail to dislodge the intersection of gender with colonial and racial power structures within global institutions. Thank you. And uh, thank you so much for, for your presentation, uh, Gopreet. And uh, that was fascinating as uh, I know that in the chat uh, section below, there's, there's already a debate uh, underway. So we'll get, to, we'll get to the questions at the end um, directed towards, uh, towards your... Um, for the time being, um, let's head over to our next speaker. Begum, are, are you here with us at the moment? I, I can't see your, yes. your video feed. Uh, I'm not sure if, oh, there you um, are, okay. Uh -huh. Hi, Hi Begum. So uh, Begum, thank you so much for, for joining us today. You are uh, our next speaker. And so I'm going to briefly introduce you to, uh, to our audience. And then after that, uh, you can take the floor. Begum is a, um, a researcher who studies uh, providing security in cyberspace uh, from a gender-based perspective. And um, she's, among other things, studies the metaverse, information technology, and social media, and as main concepts uh, that define today's world. Uh, providing a certain degree of online safety for every internet user is vitally critical, Begum explains, uh, that problems such as cyberbullying, the hacking of emails, banking information, theft, internet addiction, and child pornography, gender-based perspective and argues that gender inequality is one of the things that should be eliminated to tackle cyberspace threats. Uh, Begum is a graduate of Fatih uh, University and a renowned academic and a publisher of works uh, touching on social media, cyberspace and gender inequality. But without further ado, Begum, please take this. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity and thank you for this great event. I'm very happy of being here today. Sorry, I think uh, my Zoom application is not very updated, so that's why I look a little bit weird in front of the table <laughs> among you. Uh, so I also want to share my screen. Um, okay. Uh, uh, yes, my... Oh. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it now. Okay, okay. Uh, yes, uh, thank you again. Uh, today, uh, I want to briefly talk about uh, cybersecurity and uh, I want to have a look at uh, this concept from a gender-based perspective. Actually, it is a little, a little bit um, uh, complex to uh, analyze cybersecurity because it has two sides. One is uh, about the personal uh, uh, security in the cyberspace and also there's another one uh, um, related with uh, the nation state level. So I want to uh, make some distinction between them, but um, yes, I want to talk um, about this um, concept. Uh, we know that uh, the, the concepts like cybersecurity, cyberspace, and also metaverse and other uh, concepts like um, 
uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, these concepts are really important in today's world. And uh, we some degree familiar with this concept. So briefly, in the at the beginning of my presentation, I want to talk uh, about mm -hmm. the definitions of the uh, concepts. Uh, cybersecurity simply means uh, security in cyberspace. Cyberspace is another key concept that uh, we should uh, define here. Uh, cyberspace can be defined as a global domain within the information environments consisting of the interdependent network of information systems, infrastructures, including the internet, telecommunications networks, computer systems, and its embedded and it, uh, the embedded processors and controllers. Also, another um, definition of cyberspace can, can be uh, made like this. Uh, I want to turn off my video because I think my connection is not good, sorry. Uh, another definition is uh, about cyberspace is uh, it is the interdependent network of information technology infra infrastructures uh, again like including internet telecommunications and other you know uh, uh, online uh, stuff uh, so what are the uh, risks and threats on world wide world wide web as i said uh, uh, the first the, the uh, one side of the queen is relate queen sorry, is related with the personal side of the uh, security uh, press, uh, issues. Uh, the, the, risks, the risks and threats on the World Wide Web can be listed as the following, like uh, it can include password attacks, uh, the problem of data privacy, online theft, uh, like, you know, uh, stealing your personal uh, bank account data or other um, information, user addiction, uh, problematic social media use, and also user safety issues like uh, cyberbullying or other problems and uh, threats in cyberspace. Um, who are the actors in cyberspace? There are uh, several actors uh, operating in cyberspace. Uh, there are nation states, also, uh, corporate um, companies uh, can operate, but also other, you know, um, uh, um, the harmful groups like criminal groups, hackers, hacktivists, uh, or cyber terrorists are also uh, are other groups uh, which uh, 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 exist in cyberspace. Uh, as I noted earlier, uh, the threats in cyberspace also we can uh, uh, see it in this um, image. Like it's it, it uh, there are uh, various threats like malware, um, uh, spam emails or business email compromise, uh, the problems um, deriving from mobile apps and so on. Um, as I said, these are the. Per uh, combat these threats. We should keep our system updated. We should avoid links and the programs from unknown resources. We should use a secure connection and also uh, anti-virus software in a diligent way. Also, we should implement a strong passwords uh, to uh, provide a personal um, security in, in, in on internet. And uh, um, what uh, does gender equality has um, what kind of role has gen does gender equality play in this, you know, in fighting the threats? Um, as I said, these were the personal threats, but in terms of the threats the, which have a bigger, you know, impact, and not on personal level, but on the nation state level, uh, like, you know, the cyber crimes, uh, cyber terrorists or other, you know, uh, problems uh, in, on internet. So uh, why are... Uh, This, um, sorry, in this uh, war uh, to provide a safer internet. Uh, before that, I want to briefly uh, define what gender equality means. Gender equality is the state of equal ease of access to resources and opportunities regardless of gender, including economic participation and decision making and the state of valuing different behaviors, aspirations and needs equally regardless of danger. Uh, uh, we know that cybersecurity as an industry uh, needs a greater diversity in its workforce, 
Um, and women can add a great deal to cybersecurity, um, not only by diversifying the defender community, but also by closing the massive skills shortage and also shifting conversation around cybercrime and how to best tackle it. Um, uh, Gender-based solutions for a safer uh, internet. Actually, this safer internet, as I said, uh, it's not just on the personal level, and also for us, uh, for a better world, for a you know more uh, for a safer cyberspace, uh, which almost you know in in a globalizing world we all use the internet. So uh, the um, the security shortcoming of one person can also um, affect the security of the other individuals in the cyberspace. For example, if your email address is hacked, and uh, you you can get receive a, a, a suspicious link from a friend, then your automatically this hacking will also you know affect uh, your friends and other people's um, email boxes. Let's say uh, gender-based solutions for a safer internet. Here I want to make reference to the World Bank uh, data and uh, the report of it. Uh, the World Bank. Uh, um, uh, would like to initiate a global conversation on cybersecurity and gender issues and bring perspectives from different stakeholders to a common platform. And there are uh, a number of um, purposes behind this initiative. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, the World Bank uh, wants to highlight current good practices on how women are being included in cybersecurity. Also, in order to discuss the various challenges faced by women as cybersecurity professionals, and internet users. Um, the World Bank wants uh, to seek possible ways to address these uh, challenges. And also, uh, it is important to define what governments, civil society actors, and other private sector um, uh, players can do to make the space more diverse. Um, in a final remark, uh, as final remarks, I can say that um, gender perspectives are uh, more um, have to be discussed in a multilateral uh, in a forum for multilateral peace and security forums national uh, cyber security uh, published by apc.org and an international organization it is noted that as gender affects the way people and societies we use uh, we use weapons war militarism and gender analysis of international security uh, the gender, you know, taking the gender ac into account and um, um, uh, into account and uh, to, uh, you know, to, to take into consideration the women's perspectives is really important in order to get both uh, the personal uh, security and the larger security in the global space. Uh, thanks for giving me this chance um, uh, for my presentation. Thank you so much, Bego, for, for sharing that uh, presentation with us. And I'm sure that uh, there will be many questions for you at the end. Uh, I already see uh, in, uh, at the end of our session. But uh, thank you for, for sharing that, Bego. Uh, many fascinating things to consider there as well. And um, well, our next speaker was uh, scheduled to be Shireen. Uh, sadly, Shireen Kudosi could not join us uh, today, uh, but uh, we do have a, a, a video a presentation that was that was sent to us uh, by Shireen, very kind of her, and uh, which we'll be sharing in a moment. But before we do, uh, I'm going to briefly introduce Shireen as well, even though she's not here uh, for the audience that might not know her, and thereafter, uh, Amber or Todd, you, you maybe help me uh, put that video up. Um, Shireen's subject matter speaks about the World Bank gender inequality inquiry, um, but uh, there the supposition that it might be more inclined towards data and stats rather than theory and philosophy. So very interesting topic by, uh, by Shireen. And um, without further ado, uh, Um, as an immigrant over and over again across three continents, Shireen has lived the themes coloring our cultural policy and landscape today. She studies migration, radicalization and adaptation across seismic cultural shifts. Shireen has studied and spoken on Islamic extremism over the last 20 years, with a look at the full spectrum of extremist ideologies over the last four years. 
In 2019, Shireen grew deeply concerned about new eruptions of extremism and identity politics. And in 2021, alarmed by the normalization and accelerization of radicalization, she began establishing the Foundation for Human Belonging, a 501c3 reframing new feminine lens through which to look at the crisis of extremism and help uh, communities develop radicalization and resiliency. So without further ado, uh, Amber, if you could help me uh, set uh, Shireen's presentation up for us to take a look at. And or Todd, I'm not sure who's uh, who's doing IT today. That's yeah, Todd. I'm getting there. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Todd. But uh, in the meantime, uh, Gurpreet and Begum, thank you so much for, for your presentations today. Um, I already see that we've got uh, some questions for you. So I'll be, uh, during the presentation, taking a look at uh, some of the debate uh, that uh, your topics have raised. I see there's already a, a lively uh, discussion taking place. So thanks, everyone. And uh, just a brief reminder for our audience today, if you do have any questions, write them down. I'm taking a look at all of them. Even if I'm not responding, rest assured, I am I'm going through all of them and uh, we'll be picking them out uh, one by one and, uh, and asking them for the panel. If you have a specific speaker that you'd like your question addressed to, um, you can just type in uh, to go uh, to, to the speaker. Uh, but if you have a comment or if it's raised a thought or if it's stirred any kind of reaction in you, you can go ahead and type that in. I'm sure our speakers would be would be delighted to to hear about the, the reaction. Um, just quickly, I know Sherrod, uh, Jared has asked where Shireen Kudosi is. Uh, I, I, I'm the next speaker, I assume you, you were referring to Shireen Kudosi. Um, where she might be from. So um, I actually don't know where she is from. Uh, I know where she studied, but I don't know what her country of origin uh, might be. So I, I dare not assume that, but um, uh, I'm not sure if uh, Amber and Todd can, can perhaps type that in the chat if, if they know the answer to that one. Um, and Begum, I see that you've raised your hand. Please uh, step in. Yes. yes, I have a question. Uh. Oh, okay, I can ask later. Thank you. Sorry about that, Bigum. So uh, just to refresh everyone, uh, Shireen was sadly not able to uh, make it for today's uh, presentation in a video format. And so, Todd, thank you so much. Let's stop that off. Everybody can see the video now? Yes. yes. Oh, that has no audio, Todd. It is muted. Yes, that's muted. Um, Todd, what we might need to do is if you can unmute yourself. There we are. And uh, hopefully that should work now. Hi, my name is Sharon Dosi. I'm like to thank you counterterrorism too for having me on today and I'm here to speak about sacred feminine in de radicalization and how sacred feminine is a doorway into radicalization prevention and de radicalization. So we talk about this idea of a woman's place is in the home, right? Joanna Cook had written a book on a woman's a woman's place counterterrorism in 11 That sort of idea, for example, that a woman's place is in the home is, is such a powerful anchor because it kind of brings us right back into why a lot of women join the extremist organization, like Muslim women join the extremist Muslim organization. And the idea is, again, uh, as we discussed in the first panel, is this sort of idea of, you know, being in a traditional marriage, being married, being secure, uh, being in that traditional dynamic that does it why that appeals to them we discussed earlier. So to, to piggyback off of something that does appeal to someone in the demographic is a really powerful start. And I would say the conversation around the sacred feminine is not to bring these women. So let's say we have an ISIS bride, right? And even that terminology is still working because we're looking at ISIS bride as, as a, just defining a woman within the ideological group she chose to join and her 
gender relationship within that organization. Um, like she is a bride, a bride is, doesn't stand on her own rights in relation to a man. So we're already using a lot wrong language when we're talking about these women who we want to support, save from extremist groups, right? And, and there's a way to do it. There's a way to bring them back, but we can't bring them back from a place of um, reinforcing the stereotypes that they have about the, about the West and also through the promise of the West. So for example, you tell these women you're gonna be free, you're gonna be saved, um, you know, women's empowerment it doesn't mean anything to these women. You have to work within what they know and what they know to be home. So going back into the idea of, you know, the even the, the tagline of women's place is in the kitchen or in the home, I would say let's turn that and say, what does that actually mean? Like where did that come from? And the idea that a woman's place is in the heart. The, the heart, actually. I would say the woman's place is in the heart. And that's a really powerful doorway into looking at what does it really mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be feminine? And how do you take those ideas and, and sort of um, envelop them in the sacred? Like, how does that work? The idea of a woman's place being in the home is, is so powerful because it's, it's that first sort of um, threshold that gets crossed between uh, between uh, a common denominator in the, in the East and the West, which is a, the idea of a woman's role. And when you look at the heart, you look at it in the context of or a home, you look at it in the context of the 21st century. What does it mean to be, uh, what, is it, what does home mean in the 21st century, right? So I think in the 21st century, we're still holding on to like a really archaic idea of home that it is entirely rooted in the physical. Now, if you take that and you and you look at how Islamists look at it, they say they would actually agree. They would say, uh, you know, women are treated as homemakers and babies, baby makers, so to speak. And my sense is that the home is greater than the wall. That I search for home in all the ways I can belong, in the that we can belong. In the world. And I ask, why can't we stretch the definition of home? Why can't we see in our lexicon without triggering people by attacking their faith? So if we if I'm speaking to a woman who is considering de-radicalization de or has been or, or is um, or can even be prevented from that pathway, I would, I would start with something that's so, so familiar. It doesn't require a thesis. It doesn't require um, knowing anything more than something familiar, right? It's just a home, a heart, uh, you know, the, the sort of um, comforts of that. And then I would deepen that conversation to, you know, what did home mean back then uh, in the time of Islam's origin story and what does home mean now? What can home mean? And what does home mean within the self, right? What does home mean in, in my body? What does home mean um, in relation to uh, uh, me, in relation to the outside world? And so rather than coming at a place where we're attacking their faith or, um, you know, championing one ideology like the West, for example, and its, and its idea of freedom for women as the only thing that works, the only thing that has value, why not work within a construct we already know it and really just sort of broaden, broaden what, that, what that could mean. And in a de-radicalization program, that can be done through a lot of support mechanisms, support workshops, um, a lot of embodiment practices. I mean, there's so much that can be done if we really wanted to like break apart what this would look like within, within a program. I would say it's so important to remember that when we're working within de-radicalization, we have to work within the faith rather than the faith. And we can also say that Islam actually does speak to the feminine part, not fully, but enough to leverage de-radicalization of Muslim women. And we can do that, um, you know, without shaming women for not wanting to be in certain stores. And I'll give that a really quick example of a story as I went to Death Valley. And Death Valley has these sand dunes, and they're nothing like beach sand. There's sand, sand that you just literally step into and you sink into it. It just comes up all around you like, like hot water. And, it's awful. and I imagine that that's what it would have been like in, you know, back in the olden days and the early days of the Islamic world of women. That would have been my environment. And within seconds, my feminist would ask me to kill it. I said, I don't want to reach. That was my raw reaction, right? Not a popular reaction, but a raw reaction. I thought, I don't want to um, deal with warring in this environment. I don't want to deal with trading, I don't want to deal with hunting. 
um, I will happily give up my rights in exchange for comfort and security. Um, and it's not, it's a very hard conversation to have a lot of Western people, but it's an honest one because I'm saying that I wouldn't want to participate in that environment, right? So it's, it's not that I don't want to participate at all, it's just that environment. And it's not that a matter of being lazy per se or not having the courage. It's, I know myself enough to know that that is not my, that is not a, a landscape I will excel in. I will, I will suffer and I will take down anyone with me if they're depending on me for survival. I know that I'm better off in, in um, let's say the tent, right? But then a lot of the times when we have this conversation with Muslims, with some men also, the conversation stops there and it's a marker of, oh, you're, you're limited in capacity as a human. But we don't, again, deepen the conversation as to, okay, well, what does it mean to be human? What skill does, a, what are the soft skills a woman has, right? If, if a woman has soft skills, um, again, not to say that women aren't strong, but you know, the conversation is, the idea is that women are like flowers, we need to be protected. Well, a flower can also be, you know, has value beyond its people. Um, and even if we want to look within people, there is so much to say within the Quran, within the Sunnah, traditions of the Prophet, the things of the Prophet, where we can go and we can have these deeper, layered, uh, you know, heartfelt conversations from a place of history and theology and conceptual theology. And it doesn't have to be something that, um, again, distances a person who is coming from an extremist background or is considered an extremist background by talking down to them, um, you know, throwing facts at them or shaming them for their ideas or, or shaming them for their behavior. It's really just, it's really a conversation on belonging above and beyond absolutely anything else. And then beyond that, it's you know, how do we how do we take the idea of the sacred feminine, the feminine being at its heart that honoring the innate sanctity of the woman's life and honoring gender, not through some social construct, which you know would never be respected in this conversation with with a former extremist or a current extremist, but honoring gender through the divine, looking at the gifts that women have given within us as women, and how those gifts are desperately needed in the world today. I think ultimately we have to look at reality beyond the, beyond the individual, right? Um, beyond the perimeter of what we think is a safe conversation or a patterned conversation. So to go back to only talking about extremism and masculine lens because it's a patterned conversation, it's predictable and it falls short when you look at the, the full scope of where we can go with really coming um, forward in how we evolving in how we talk about extremism and the passes we can create to get people off that track or to prevent them from ever getting fine. It's not a people problem, it's an idea problem. And at the heart of it, I think we all are invited to be curious about why good people join bad ideas. And looking at every single conversation point, every single angle, where that conversation can be had. And I think the sacred feminine, I believe, constantly the sacred feminine is one of those pathways. And it's not one of those pathways that's, that's rare or fringe anymore. In fact, there were a couple of conferences this year alone, one in DC, one in DC, it was a type of women's conference, and another one, uh, the International Ministerial Conference on Freedom of Religion or Belief. Both had a gender equality component. Uh, the DC conference specifically mentioned sacred feminism. So these are not abstract, you know, woo-woo ideas. These are ideas rooted in history. Um, these are ideas, uh, I think books I can recommend you. So if you just uh, reach out to me on social media or on my website, uh, shrinkbosey.com for a list of some of those references or to have a deeper conversation on using the sacred feminine um, path to Okay, thank you so much, Todd, for sharing that. And of course, thank you to uh, Shireen uh, Kudosi for, uh, for that uh, very enlightening video and uh, for the topics discussed. Uh, there, were, um, there was a lot to say about the role of agents. Uh, interesting. And of course, uh, Shireen won't be here to answer the questions, uh, sadly, but 
if um, if any of our audience and or panel has a question relating to that, uh, then rest assured that the rest of the panel is uh, each uh, highly uh, accomplished and, uh, and intelligent uh, and academics and researchers uh, that I'm sure would be more than happy to uh, to step in Shireen's place and perhaps uh, answer some of the issues raised. So if you do have any any thoughts, comments or questions raised uh, by Shireen's presentation, go ahead, type them in and we'll take them up. But without uh, further ado, Shireen, if you're hearing this as a later recording, thank you for sending that in. Uh, very kind of you to share that video with us. And of course, uh, we're sad not to have you here uh, today, but uh, regardless, the video did a great, uh, great job. And so finally, our last panelist and also host of today's uh, event is none other than uh, Miss Amber uh, Okunda. Uh, Amber, uh, well, it's great. if you'll allow me, uh, just a short biography on yourself and the uh, topic that you'll cover today. Um, so Amber is a, um, a current research fellow and director of uh, operations at the Global Counterterrorism Institute, which is hosting today's webinar. Uh, she earned her Master of Science degree at, in Homeland Security Management at uh, the Homeland Security and Terrorism Institute, Long Island University. Previously, she earned her BA degree in political science at Pennsylvania State University. She has a strong academic background in terrorism, including extensive coursework in recruitment, propaganda, radicalization, and a focus on the use of social media for self-radicalization. Within her academic career, she has done extensive study and work on the role that media plays on terrorism, the radicalization process, and how to identify the signs of escalating radicalization. Amber is an expert in terrorism, recruitment, propaganda, and radicalization. She also works with nonprofit organizations to promote radicalization awareness, intervention, education, and the empowerment of marginalized communities worldwide, emphasizing the area of the Middle East. And today, Amber uh, will be speaking about terrorism, violent extremism, and the initiatives that are put in place to counter it and continue to be male dominated areas. The archetypes when discussing terrorism and extremism, the avenues for recruitment and the action taken by the violent actors uh, when viewed with the approach of predominantly male participants. So Amber, very interesting topic and uh, I'll let you take the floor with uh, explaining the rest of it. Amber, I think you're muted. Still muting. Yes, thank you for that, that introduction, Thomas. Um, it was wonderful. and. I'm so happy to have gone after all of these brilliant women, because a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today does touch on a lot of the topics that they have. The different perspective and a different, you know, lens of how we're looking at this at, at this issue. And really what I want to discuss today is that the roles of the female participants in rebel groups are often overlooked or neglected. And this is mainly because of that stereotypical view of women um, emphasizing their place as victims of terrorism. And that characterization has become pretty obsolete by the male dominated active roles in terrorism. The, the actions of women are still viewed as an an aberration. They are, they, they are not taken seriously in effect. And we have seen a surge in female suicide bombers mainly used to subvert security measures in both secular and religious organizations. So when we take a look at the gender specific demographics and radicalization metrics, there was a study done that reviewed uh, 1,867 radicalized individuals within the United States between 1948 and 2016. And in this group, 22% of women participated in the far right, 15% in the far left, and 10% in the Islamist extremist activities. So there's no cut and dry corner you can place female participants that they only participate in one, sec in one sector or another. Um, women who are participating in these activities, 33% were single when you want to compare that to the 55% of men that were that were single and participating. Um, and this was most pronounced in the Islamist and far right groups where single women were active participants. Um, women also tended to have higher levels of college or vocational schooling compared to their male counterparts within this study. So really across all of these groups, only less than 1% 
had any military experience. So participation in these violent attacks, 60% of men took part in the planning, directing, and higher operational uh, positions, whereas that was only 40% of women. And this disparity was most recognized within Islamist groups. And these percentages will make sense more as the as we go on. But really what this does signify as a starting point is there's no single pathway to radicalization. There's no single profile. It is not possible to create even a broad profile of females at risk of radicalization based on age, location, ethnicity, family relations, or religious backgrounds. Women join for the same psychological, personal, social, economic, and political reasons as men do. Many have attributed this rebelliousness and desire for action, drive for power, promise of adventure, attraction to politics, and a commitment to a And these are all seen in the propaganda and recruitment process. They're calling on these motivations of both men and women equally because they're calling upon those same needs that, that each male and female look upon and they're looking to be a part of. So as we talk more about the motivations of it, women usually join voluntarily. So their motivation in, includes personal grievance, or religious and political ideology commitments or socioeconomic needs. Women join overall with highly contextualized dependent motivations. Um, there's no whim as as was discussed earlier, you know, females are are seen as acting on on emotion or can you know change direction frequently based on that emotional need. But yet, when we look at women who have been recruited and radicalized, their motive. Mia Bloom um, identified uh, several key drivers for women involved in terrorist groups, which she referred to as the four R's plus one. And those are revenge, redemption, relationships, respect, and rape. And women suicide attackers, for example, in the um, Israeli-Palestine context were motivated by revenge, uh, while the affiliated those affiliated with the Sri Lanka Tamil Tigers, they sought to revolt against a repressive state policies. So we have different motivations here for, for different actors in different contexts. Studies have shown that women are more likely to participate in violent groups in repressive societies where they're deprived of freedom, political empowerment, or social equality. And so a higher level of a woman's social rights reduces the chance that she can be recruited and therefore radicalized. It does and then conversely, higher levels of, of unemployment within the female labor force can significantly drive up the likelihood that violent organizations will be able to recruit female combatants. So there's a lack of socioeconomic opportunities for women lower the cost of joining a violent group and be more tolerant of that cost associated with membership. And what this, the, this cost of joining this organization shows is the impact of social and political settings on human choices and a willingness for women to pick up arms and support a violent organization. In addition to these broader motivations, women have joined due to personal grievances, a sense of isolation, the commitment to supporting uh, the caliphate in reference to jihadist recruits or just seeking adventure. And these reasons are reinforced consistently by, by recruiting more directly to a female audience. And we really see this super clearly in Bin Emergence Twitter accounts, which are basically like a playbook for how to propagate towards women. Then we have the Center on Global uh, Counterterrorism Cooperation. They stated several push factors specific to women recruitment, grievances about their socioeconomic and sociopolitical political conditions, excuse me, grief following the death of a loved one, and intention to receive economic benefits or a desire to, to achieve a radical social change. 
And this gender-based inequality and discrimination, violence against women, and lack of educational and economic opportunities shut off doors for, for women to move outside of those organizations. And these, these excuse me, violent extremist terrorist organizations feed off of that lack of opportunity and present the opportunity to these women for recruitment and propaganda purposes. And earlier I mentioned one of Mia Bloom's um, indicators or uh, factors were rape. Women who have been raped will turn to become suicide bombers, for example. And this is mostly seen in societies where the rape victim brings on the shame to their families. If they, they are seen as the cause for that. And so they're looking for a way out. They're looking for a way to replace that shame that their society has placed on a rape victim and replace that with a positive one. So they're looking to be a martyr for the cause. And that has been a, a driving factor in several female suicide attackers. Women have been used to exploit these gender stereotypes to get past the security personnel, avoid detection, boost media attention, and shame men into action. And this is a way, again, that women are used, and they're used successfully because of the male-dominated perspective of counterterrorism measures. When we look more at the recruitment, we're seeing, again, women join for the same reasons as men do. And robust counterterrorism and preventative measures that impedes radicalization and recruitment needs to address women specifically. Because as of right now, most of these measures, again, take women involvement as a blip, as an anomaly. It's not taken with the with, with the enormity that it really deserves. And when we look at what are these counterterrorism and preventative measures, that's delegitimizing extremist ideologies by strategic communications. They're blocking online recruitment platforms and reintegr reintegrating individuals into mainstream society. These measures should be addressed with a gendered approach as women are recruited in various combatant and non-combatant roles in an ideologically diverse universe. Every single organization, whether it is secular, whether it was religious, whether it is violent, whether it is not violent, attracts and recruits women just as they do men. This is really exemplified by the Tamil Tigers, the Kurdistan Workers Party. And when we look at 166 violent groups within Africa, women's participation was much higher with those groups that had gender inclusive ideologies. So women are flocking more to those violent groups than they are to those that have more conservative gender related ideologies. And um, the, the two women, Jacana Thomas and Kanisha Bond, who did that, that study, took their analysis one step further and looked at how the ideology affects a group's proclivity, proclivity to recruit women into combat roles specifically. And when we're looking at 211 rebel groups they, that were organized, the leftist ideologies, which generally tend to attract female recruits, are more likely to employ women in combat roles. And these groups subsequently have a more lenient gender role identity. And the opposite can be can be said for Islamist groups, which which suggests that women engaging in jihad were predominantly only to serve in supportive roles. And when we look at terrorist organizations around the world, when we're when lo we're looking at female recruitment, the older and larger organizations tend to attract more females. And these insurgent groups that control territory are more likely to actively recruit females for, for the, the two main reasons that one, women can deepen a group's links within the community of that territory. And two, recruiting women fighters boost a group's heightened operational need to physically protect their home base. So while they are still put in the corner of you're in a supportive role, they're still expected to take on a, an active role in defense of their home base. And this really 
highlights, again, the need for a counterterrorism perspective to be attentive to a group's age and operational needs, which can increase the inclination to diversify its human capital by expanding its recruitment and indoctrination of women. And women's recruitment and radicalization are usually the result and their broader socioeconomic and political environments. When these conditions are poor, it may contribute to a men's radicalization and recruitment as much as women's, but it's augmented by gender as these conditions don't affect men and women equally. So poor socioeconomic or political conditions, while they may both appeal and be motivating factors for men and women, a man and a woman in that same circumstance will have two very different experiences and therefore their motivations, while in the broader sense may be the same, contextualized, they're very different because men and women experience those challenges differently. And when we're looking specifically at jihadist recruits, because they have probably one of the, the more interesting uh, evolutions of women in their in, in their organizations, the Islamic State has and the the global nature of transnational networks in the Islamic State means that trends in one region are going to trigger to changes in another. So women that are connected with the jihad are generally linked to those domestic roles, mothers, wives, sisters. They engage in fundraising and disseminating propaganda. Where we can take Al Qaeda, which has largely followed gender specific interpretations of the female jihadi and their roles of women within their organization are highly gender specific. Now the, the, the Islamic State has really shown to be much more flexible and really the, the survival of their group demanded it. When they lost significant territory in Iraq and Syria, that mobilized the change for all women to take part actively. And this follows suit of the use of women in more predominant, more, the use intensified security and an in, in increase in counterterrorism measures. So we see this shifting attitude towards female combatants elsewhere, right? Specifically in global affiliates. So a change in one area within that organization, its other affiliates elsewhere are gonna see those changes adapt and change as well. We can see in December 2016, Indonesian law enforcement arrested a 29-year-old uh, Dion Yulianovi. Sorry if I said that incorrectly. Um, she was um, committed to being a martyr for the Islamic State. And she was arrested on suspicion of plotting a suicide attack on the president's pal palace in Indonesia. April 2019, for the Sh Sri Lanka attacks, which were claimed by the Islamic State, they claimed the lives of 359 people, which included female suicide attackers. Philippines, Indonesia, and Malaysia really give us an indication that the total number of female participants who were captured or killed are steadily increasing. So they are taking a more active and a more visible role within their activities. So these organizations went from forbidding women to participate in combat to calling upon them to engage in defensive combat in 2016 to actively engaging in jihad uh, for the caliphate by, by late 2017. So we really see this 180 shift in their use and their recruitment and their call to female participants. This alone has caused a cascade of other organizations to actively propagate towards women. We see it in uh, the Tariqi Taliban in Pakistan had, has since released propaganda publications that openly solicit operational activities. This is the first time, and it happened in 2017, that this group has ever openly solicited to female participants.
So we see this dichotomy within these two groups as well. We see groups that are simultaneously espousing extremely conservative views of women while still calling upon them and using these female attackers. When we move beyond the um, high, the religious contextualized groups, we can look at um, Betty Shape. She was a former female uh, member of a neo-Nazi terrorist cell um, group, and she was sentenced to life in prison in July 2018 for multiple murders, bombings, and robberies. So this example is telling of how far right extremist organizations are known to recruit women. But in some cases, these groups are also catering to their female Church of the Creator is a white nationalist group in the United States and overseas, and they have several chapters that are specifically for women. So this increasingly modern view on gender and sexuality are appealing to a wider audience. And at the same time, that reduces the stigma of association. So that links back to the cost of being a part of this organization. It's lowering that cost as their views become more modern and more moderate. And we can look at, this is demonstrated um, for active participation and recruitment of women across the entire spectrum of violent extremist organizations. Social media and the internet media in general has allowed for greater participation for females to access uh, propaganda material. And this also plays to the call that a lot of organizations are using as cells. So propaganda that is targeted at women doesn't always have to follow the modern view. We have to keep in mind that traditional gender roles are still frequently used in recruitment and radicalization. So there's no, you know, one size fits all for this. It is two ends of the spectrum that covers the entirety of, of these violent organizations. When we are looking at the, you know, ISIS brides, they're using kinship and romantic relationships that can play an important role in drawing females into their organizations. These propagandists, they're usually aiming at contrasting negative narratives of a Muslim woman's experience in Western society with positive narratives about their contributions to a new state. So we see this a lot in the online grooming process to bring organizations. And this type of propaganda may not call for violence, but it does encourage an intolerant interpretation of religion or social norms with restrictive gender roles. So this indoctrination is then passed down by women to their children, to other family members, who will then more likely be supportive of more extremist views. So this traditional role that women are usually automatically cast into as caregivers, this role itself can really empower them to protect their cultural, social, religious values and pass that down to the next generation. And they do this through encouraging martyrdom and keeping an organization viable through consistent propaganda, recruitment, fundraising, and a myriad of other supporting activities. And where we see this the most right now is it's in a lot of women to women online recruitment, these online platforms, these groups that women are forming together within these male dominated societies and, and organizations, they're, they're talking to each other and bringing in other women into their own organizations. So by not addressing a gendered perspective, of the recruitment into violent organizations, states will continue to be lacking in its strategic, I'm sorry, in its strategies rather, to prevent the radicalization of anyone, but of women in particular. So we can really see that, that change where, again, it's on both ends of the spectrum, but it does cover all uh, extremist groups in its entirety. Thank you. Thank you, Amber. That was a, a, a very complete picture and a, a very 
well, a, a lot to digest, I'm sure, and a lot to unpack, and uh, I'm sure uh, um, a lot of reaction from our chat um, that uh, is thanking you uh, for that amazing presentation. Of course, uh, thank you from myself, and as I'm sure from the other panelists. Um, now, there was a few questions that in a moment we're just going to um, to take a part uh, for the moment, but I did want to take a second, um, not only just to thank you, but to thank Dr. Kaur and to thank Begum as well. Um, Begum, I'm not sure if if you're with us at the moment, but uh, yes. whenever you can. Oh, you are. Okay, great. So if everybody's ready, uh, I might suggest um, starting with some of the questions that the chat has raised in the Q&A section. And um, the way I'll do it is if it's addressed to a specific speaker, it will go to you towards you first. And if it's a more broad question, or if one of the panelists wants to step in, um, please go right ahead. Uh, and before we start things off, I did want to mention um, Jared Crockett uh, had asked a question of uh, the birthplace of uh, the speaker <coughs> center video in Shireen Kudosi, who um, unfortunately couldn't make it in for today. From what, from what I was able to find uh, through, through the website that was posted uh, uh, there, Jared, I believe uh, she was born in Soviet Afghanistan, uh, with uh, parents being, I believe, uh, Pakistani in origin. Uh, Afghan Pakistani family uh, and then from a young age moved uh, to Pakistan. However, her profile states that she was a refugee in, in at least three different continents uh, during her youth. So I'm sure Shireen sadly is not here to, to explain it a bit better, but I, I hope that uh, that answered uh, some of that background information for you, Joe. And um, well, the first thing I wanted to start with uh, was a question directed towards yourself, uh, Gurpri, because uh, I believe it was repeated uh, twice, once question of, in your study, which countries specifically were being taken a look at? I think India is one that I remember uh, you talking about, but uh, were there any other countries in your presentation that were also being surveyed? So I specifically looked at laws and policies, um, historically contextualized, uh, particularly colonization onwards, um, and how it has affected um, a ripple effect of sorts with uh, how it has engendered structural inequality and how that keeps happening till today with um, neo-colonial um, structures in place. So, yeah. And it, with it's just looking at India specifically, or any other? Not group? India. It's uh, India, Philippines, Thailand, Africa. A lot of Africa, MENA region. In fact, uh, when um, I, I don't know if anyone knows this, uh, with uh, when British actually colonized India, they had the Indian Indian Penal Code system, which was. Uh, in effect, came into effect in 1860s, I think it was 1863 or 1864, which was then uh, used as the basis for all MENA region, so Sudan, Sudan has the IPC as its basis, that was uh, transferred over to the settler colonies, so the whole of um, Southeast Asia that was colonized by the British, uh, and a lot of the colonial laws are still retained in current day, um, uh, you know, the, the, the legislation. So uh, you, you have a widespread from Egypt to, you know, down all the way to Southeast Asia, India and Africa, just majorly known because they were they were the they are the most cited um, countries when it comes to. Gurpreet, thank you for that, and uh, and I think that should clarify uh, that that question for for anybody who who might have been wondering. And um, so, well, I have a comment here that uh, uh, Mar Mariah Murray, I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, had um, had put down, and I thought it was great because it, it touched on it touches on a, a theme that was in in all of your presentations. And um, she says, uh, I agree, women are seen as lacking political agency. The mass media have described women as being manipulated, motivated by love uh, and or largely as victims. And uh, I think this is really important. And I, and I think back of uh, Amber, your presentation and, and your topic that you just did today, and I couldn't help but think 
uh, from, from my position here after hearing the, the three of your uh, your presentations today that um, a lot of this uh, a lot of the way we look at female terrorists is in a way it, it it's difficult because it's colored by a lens Could have elements of sexism and genderism uh, that we carry in our day-to-day -day lives uh, because these issues are uh, not resolved here in the west and, and any more than they are in other places and and so i think um, the image or the archetype of the female terrorist throw, tends to throw a spanner in the works of uh, the way that we look at women more broadly speaking and it challenges our perceptions we we cannot understand how a, a woman can have agency to to commit a heinous act and so um, we put them in these preconceived labels and, and boxes so i think that's that's a really interesting um comment uh, that made by uh, mariah murray and so i'm, I'm interested in, in sort of hearing the panel's uh, understanding of of how our gender stereotypes and stereotypes we have towards women as being uh, um, nurturers or caregivers uh, conflates and conflicts with this alternative notion of the female terrorist. Eben, sorry, Amber, perhaps we can start with you. I, I, I guess I'll start. Um, I think that it certainly is, uh, it is not a one face issue. It, it certainly is both sides of the coin. Um, where it, this idea of stereotypes and gender roles um, in reinforce that perspective is where we see it, like I said, when it's being reinforced in those specific gender roles. But with that comes the expectation that they will continue to push their ideologies, to groom their kids, family members, their communities at a whole in support of these, of, of these organizations whether it's a religious organization, whether it is, you know, a far right organization, as um, I think Shireen said, women are, are the heart of the home, right? Home, that's where your fundamental ideas, biases, perspectives are formed is in the home. So that's where women can really show that traditional role being extremely effective. And on the flip side, where that really contrasts is that the more that women are leaving that traditional role, that traditional um, pigeonhole that they were originally put in, they don't have the, or rather the framework is not there for women to participate in combat roles. So you have a women entering a male dominated entity, whatever that entity is. And now they have to figure out, well, where do I fit in? Because it can be a, something as simple as a bathroom. Their own bathroom in an organization when they are leaving. So you have this entity who is trying to bring in women who is outside of their original framework and trying to figure out and kind of push, push a, a round peg into a square hole. Right? It's not always going to fit. But if you push hard enough and long enough, the entity itself and the women entering it will form together to create a cohesive unit, essentially. What that looks like when we're talking more broad in uh, counterterrorism, you know, measures, um, you know, when we're looking at how to counter that, that's going to be a completely different story. But the perspective itself, I mean, that's at least a starting point that, that we can look at. Thank you, Amber. And uh, unless um, Dr. Cora or Begum would like to step in, uh, I'll just skip over to the next question. I think, uh, Thomas, you, uh, um, you might be familiar with this. We had a fireside in you know, a chat with this. So uh, I think one of the one of the things we have to be a bit careful when we talk about, you know, how 
uh, social media has been used, how um, indoctrination happens, how grooming happens, is there's an assumption, exactly as Mariah has said, and this is forming a huge part of my work that I'm doing currently, is that there's a very, very big assumption that women are just kind of like sponges. They kind of sit there and they're just absorbing everything that's thrown at them. Um, that assumption doesn't exist with men. So I was talking with Thomas, I said, when you actually talk about, you know, a terrorist, the image that comes to your mind is a male and the actions of that male are very rational. The violence is rationalized. What happens when you talk about a female terrorist is precisely. So there's a stereotype which says that women are supposed to be a certain way. Therefore, the violence is exceptional. And because the violence becomes exceptional, it becomes sensationalized. And when, when that happens, a lot of the rhetoric on why, why women do this is women are sponges, they're indoctrinated, they're groomed. Uh, and a lot of the nuances that happen with this are completely lost. They're completely lost. And what happens with um, Mia Bloom's framework also is, when she says, when she talks about revenge, she talks about this. She's again, since exceptionalizing all of this, um, and it falls back on the framework of women act because they're personally injured. So the political motivations, the political agency is never accounted for. And uh, women are not sponges, you know, um, they, they, they engage, they choose what they want and they reject what they don't want. And exactly as you said, Amber, every, the thing is both men and women live in a society which is gendered. And those assumptions work between both men and women and how women then get affected, they're just particularized. Um, but the reasons almost always are the same as men, exactly as you said. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Jeff. just to add a little bit onto that, Bruce, I 100% agree is that when we look at a male terrorist, right, it's more of seen and they have these grandiose, you know, political aspirations, and they're going to overthrow a government or they're going to do this or that. But then when we flip the script and look at a female, it's, oh, well, how was she injured? How was she involved? How you know what what happened to her there's it's extremely personalized whereas men are it's externalized so i completely agree with you on that yeah 100 percent. okay really interesting uh exchange between the, the both of you but switching topics a little bit here we have a question from Alyssa scoringer or scoringe um sorry if i butchered your your last name there and uh, she wants to know directed towards Gurpreet structurally what do you see as the highest priority to address desperation and activation and where in terms of urgency I guess that relates uh, uh, roughly to doing your presentation speaking about uh, efforts and uh, to de-radicalize um, I would imagine but Melissa if you want to correct me there please I think I, I don't I don't see this in terms of a hierarchy. What I am seeing is that there are ripple knock-on effects from one thing that leads to another, and it just gets keeps getting compounded. And one of the things that I'm in mind is that you you can't see it in silos. You can't see it in a vacuum. Everything is relational. And we 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 exist in a society that is actually relational, right? Um, and the I don't think there is a hierarchy in terms of what, but I think one of the things structurally that really, really needs to change are gender stereotypes. Um, it, it is so important because we are seeing that again, Thomas, as we were talking in a fireside chat, right? Um, I don't know if uh, uh, anyone has come across Andrew Tate's video that has suddenly gone quite, quite viral in the last couple of weeks. So there's this guy who's on TikTok and um, he's he's become successful. And then he's saying, oh, um, if I, uh, my girlfriend is going to stay at home, she's going to get, she's, she's going to be pregnant. She's going to give birth. Um, 
chokehold. I'm going to give her two tight slaps and I'm going to show her her place. And that video has gone viral. It's gone like boys as young as 13 year olds are, are, are actually endorsing the video. Teachers are getting in a frenzy. Like, how do we talk about this to, to our boys, to our girls, right? Um, it, gender inequality is everywhere. It's not just within certain groups. It's not in just terrorist ideologies. It's everywhere. And we need to start with changing these gender stereotypes that it's okay to it's okay to hit women. It's okay to be high in, in a hierarchical you know, situation. It's okay. Women are subservient. Women are caring. Women are nurturing. Men are not like that. Men can be like that. You know, so it's, um, I think all of that has to change. That's why it's called structural, structural factors. Yeah. And of course, these structural factors exist um beyond terrorist groups but also within wider society i know for example jared crockett was mentioning the the um the status of women in military organizations and uh, more specifically um how uh, for example uh, in some certain combat situations and especially in the uh, let's say logistical situations of the barracks uh, that that these situations have not been formalized have not been divided the same amount of training has not been given to which I would um, I would preliminarily agree with Jared that there is a sharp divide, even in how we treat women in the armed forces. Do, does the panel have any comment on, on that? Begum, perhaps, or uh, Amber, if you'd like to step in and uh, show. Yes, you. Uh, I want to make some comments about this. Uh, I totally agree with uh, Kubrit. Yes, I think the structural inequality um, plays a key role in the reproduction of this. You know, the subordination of women. Uh, and I think uh, education uh, is really important in combating this structural uh, inequalities. And also, uh, if you want to internalize the idea that women and men are equal, then um, not just on education at school, but also at the, at, at the grassroots level, I think we need, we need some kind of, you know, uh, in the family, uh, this education begins. Because um, if I want to if I can give an example from my own country, in the traditional, uh, you know, um, paternalistic countries, uh, the patriarchal, sorry, not paternalistic, but patriarchy is the concept that I must use. Uh, the women, yes, they are seen as sec not secondary, but they are um, like seen as they belong to the uh, uh, to the works of households. So uh, the men, yes, they are. Uh, so I think, yes, uh, in order to have this equality, first of all, we should uh, educate them, again, educate the mothers to educate their son and other family members to see women as uh, precious as the, as the man. Thank you. Thank you for that, Begum. And... Um... Here we have a, a, another one of the questions uh, from our audience today, and it has to do with um, uh, Wilson Mingola's question that he's asking, why is it that when terrorists are, arrest are arrested after an act, they don't show any remorse? Uh, most often they smile. And perhaps adding to that question is, do, do we see the same uh, type of behaviours uh, with uh, women terrorists that have been caught after an act? Is there any disparity there and the research that you're looking at and and can we explain if there is a difference in um, in let's say a, a show us anything about uh you know is there any fundamental changes that we can look at uh, between female and male perpetrators of terrorism and as far as motivation goes and and lastly perhaps tacking onto that as well that if there is is uh, for example a revenge factor it might be a difference um, do do women and male uh, radicalization uh, as a result of revenge motivation are they different substantially uh, between the genders? And if anybody would like to jump in and tackle that uh, that tough question, uh, please be my guest, Gopreet or Amber, perhaps if you have a comment. Well, I think that's complex, and that's going to change uh, variously uh, based on who, what, where, when, and how, right? Um, but when 
I think one of the biggest ways we've seen, at least recently, and um, view of just what, what I've been looking at is when we see these individuals, and this is not specifically for just extremists or terrorists. I mean, this could be applicable to really any any actor who has committed an act of violence is that when we see that that lack of remorse, let's say, it's not so much that they're thinking about what they've done, they're thinking about what does this mean for me? And that can ha- and that can have different motivations um, behind it as well. If you're looking at an extremist view, you can look at propaganda by deed. That is one of the most significant ways organizations can show their power is by committing an act of violence. Then you had on if you add on top who is arrested, who will have a trial. And this prolongs the amount of time that they remain in the media's eye the media and extremist organizations, they have a very symbiotic relationship. They feed off of each other. So the media gets higher ratings because look, we're covering this exciting trial of this guy who committed an event. And then you have an organization who's reaping all the benefits of look, they're showing why we're fighting. They're showing what has been done to us. This is why we attack this person. So it becomes less about the incident itself and more about the person, the organization, and their reasons, because it just provides more of a public eye. And that itself can be propaganda to others who have said, yeah, I I kind of agree with that. Let me go online of finding these organizations. And then what happens, that begins, that sparks an individual's, or it can, not will, it can spark an individual's self-radicalization because they're hearing something that has already fed on an internal bias or view or perspective. And then they're finding others who have felt the same way. Then they're in these chat rooms and they enter the echo chamber and they spur them on, spur them on, spur them on until they then want to act in that cause's name. So it's it's less about the attack. It's less about the individual and more about the broader picture, in my opinion. Thank you for sharing that, Amber. And uh, well, these have been really fascinating questions. Uh, if I might be so bold, one for me uh, to the panel um, as we're speaking about this, but I, I know that we've mentioned Um, about the uh, remorse, uh, let's say, or uh, and we've spoken a bit about revenge, uh, but putting these together, um, and this is directed towards uh, any any one of you three that wants to jump in. Um, when the media, which is what we're taking a look at with this question, um, the Western media takes a look at, um, for example, uh, uh, these cases like uh, Sharon Tate or other female terrorists, um, does, do you believe it often conflates this idea that if a woman becomes a, a terrorist, um, then she must do so out of this monstrosity of revenge, out of, out of completely misguided emotions that she could not control, and in a way playing into this myth of the woman as this irrational, um, you know, emotionally driven, um, family protecting uh, vehicle, and um, And does it throw a spanner in the works? And are we just not ready as a society to understand that um, factors and of course agency uh, used uh, perhaps uh, violently and illegally and horrendously, but still agency. And and how do you see this dichotomy between uh, the media and uh, wanting to sell the classic story of uh, its female prototype and then is reality different from that? I think, I, I, I'm sorry, were you, were you gonna go? Go ahead, go okay. ahead. 
I think that as as you said, Thomas, you know, as a society, are we ready for that? And especially in Western media. And I'm actually going to take an example that's not a female, but Timothy McVeigh. When he was arrested after the Oklahoma City bombing, they were labeling him a terrorist. And Western society, the United States was like, what? I see this, you know, white, crew cut, blue eyed, blonde guy walking down. It totally did not fit in with what the society's perception of what a terrorist should look like. So that sparked a whole, you know, what happened to him and how did this happen and all of that. And I think that that same wonder, that same interest is the same when we see females rather than the traditional, you know, male terrorists is it's not so much about the cause, but it's more about what happened to them. And this, again, you know, like the priest said, it all circles back, right, to what is that internal struggle, that internal, you know, motivation. And I think that when we're talking about media, media tends to grab on to anything that doesn't fit the norm, because that's what people are interested in. And that's what gets sensationalized. And that's really how those two, you know, organizations or individuals and the media really come together is that mutual feeding off of each other. Thank you for that, Amber. And uh, Gopri Begum, if you have any comment, please uh, feel free. I, I'd just like to add that um, exactly as you said, Thomas, that uh, my, my experience is that uh, more often than not, uh, when you portray a female terrorist, it's always uh, more, more than exactly what you said, Amber, what happened internally. But you don't really find that with a male terrorist, particularly who's a Muslim, you know, that doesn't happen. Um, and uh, in the UK, those of you who are based in the UK, you might have heard, uh, particularly when um, ISIS recruiting was happened, there was a 15 year old girl called Shamima Begum. Uh, she It it uh it sparked off right um the the media the, the way the news reports it uh, uh Pierce Morgan's uh, famous words right they go there they cook for them they clean for them uh they bear their babies they marry them to them I say go f yourselves right the whole narrative is structured around she's a mother she has a wife she is this um. And it is always, always personalized on that level. Um, and in all of this, I think two factors get forgotten. One is that when someone is recruited as a 15 year old, in most um, countries, a 15 year old legally is still a child. And we see that in a lot of international criminal law cases where particularly the Ongwen case that's going you know, uh, the, uh, that's still going on, I think, in the ICC, that what happens when you have a child actor who then perpetrates crime, right? Um, with female terrorists, uh, what I've noticed, it, it, it becomes so sensationalized that that aspect actually gets completely drowned out, that someone who was groomed or taken in at 15 was legally a child. And the agency that happens later on or when women are recruited as adults later on, you know, they, their agency, their political agency is then couched as revenge. Uh, I'm a mother, uh, uh, you know, my whole family was decimated, this, that, you know. So I agree, Thomas, a lot of it. In fact, it's very rare to find, um, you know, a depiction or, you know, you, when you talk about ISIS or, you know, female terrorists within them, something that is not sensationalized. And these two factors are considered. So, yeah, just just my two cents for us. Thank you for no, that. Absolutely. But I would like to add in because you brought up a really, a really good point is that when especially young girls are being recruited, I mean, that grooming process is continuous and it and it can and that that grooming process, especially with young girls, 
We see that in terrorist organizations. We see it in cults. We see it all over to where you're taking somebody who, okay, has like an idea of the world, but they're not an adult. They don't have that, you know, that sense. And a lot of them have that lack of self sense to recognize it and back away. And unfortunately it happens when it's too late. And so it's really, it's, it's like you said, it gets sensationalized and what needs to be for there to like have their babies, exactly what, like you said. So completely agree. Thank you, uh, both Gurpreet, Amber, and of course, Begum for answering these questions. Uh, sadly, that's all we have time for today, but, um, well, this has been a really enlightening event today, and I think we've we've unearthed together a little bit here that there, there is a regressive, biased narrative of women, uh, not only in security, but also women in terrorism. Um, and there's many barriers to overcome, lots of work to be done, but I wanted to thank the panel uh, for being part of that change.